everything right now. And we talked about that we spent three hours on Genesis 1-1 explaining what that means. It's very complicated. It's very complicated. But if something is, it's because it is being held together right now. This isn't something that just started and will continue. God is actively holding this universe together and he says he's doing it through Jesus. So that's how great of a creator we have and how great of a savior we serve. But he has every right to do this and people have to get beyond their preconceived notions about verses like this. Because if you don't, you end up questioning God's sovereignty and you also end up going to liberal theology uh, seminaries which teach that God really of the Old Testament was a bad God when it's the same God in both Testaments. And I hear that all the time from people. You know, you'll see it on the History Channel if you watch those, those people that talk on there. Well, the God of the Old Testament was angry and he was blah, 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 but since then we have new stuff. God doesn't change. It is the same God, but he's doing certain things for his sovereign purposes. So please don't be offended by the things that you're reading or are going to read in a couple verses. Okay, go ahead. That's right. That's right, because they don't want to face that this God is the same God, but he is doing, he, and he's going to do exactly the same thing in the New Testament as he did in the Old. It's just that we're doing it under the covenant of Jesus. But Revelation is pretty clear about what's happening to the nations, or going to happen to the nations. It's the same thing is going to happen. Okay. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform your duty as a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. Now this is a cultural norm. Later it was solidified in the law, but this is before the law. People will, and I've said this before, but just so you know, people will take something from the Old Testament, from uh, Genesis or Exodus, before the law, and they will insert it into the law of the Levites. And they'll say, well, this was part of the Leveret Law. It has nothing to do with Levi. Levi isn't even born yet. We can't insert what happened before the law into the law. And we've talked about this on several other issues where people will say, it must be this because the law says. The law had not yet been written. This was a cultural norm that God adapted into the law of Levi. He didn't say, we're going to change everything and everything that you've been doing is completely wrong. No, he took parts of the code of Hammurabi. He took parts of the culture of the people of, uh, you know, uh, upper Mesopotamia, and he incorporated them into the law of Moses. And this particular thing that happened here is, was a cultural thing that predates the law, but it is included in the law. And what's happened is the oldest son was given a wife by Judah. Ur died. And so Judah says, we want you to the next son, take her and you will have a son and that son will be named after Ur because we want the name of Ur to continue. That's the way that the culture was worked. And God didn't interfere with that when he made the law of Moses. He said, we're going to incorporate that because that's important to the people of this society. We don't do that now because it's not important to us. Okay, Jesus Christ has assured us that that person, if he's a Christian, will be raised from the dead and his name will continue on forever anyway. So we don't have the same thing going on. But this is what was happening. He was told, you will go in and you have a son and he will be named after Ur, not after you. And so we're going to see in the next verse what Onan did. And it, like I said, it's very explicit, so I hope you don't take offense. Go ahead. And Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, so it came about that when he went into his brother's wife, he wasted his seed on the ground in order not to give offspring to his brother. But what he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord, so he took his life also. Very explicit there. And it was displeasing in the sight of the Lord because his father is his father. His father asked him to do this thing. And it was also the cultural norm, which may have gone all the way back to Adam. We have no idea. It doesn't say that. So we don't want to insert that into the Bible. But whatever it was, the Lord was displeased because he was disobeying a family uh, requirement. And if we go to the book of Jeremiah, you will read about a group of people called the Rechabites. You know the story of the Rechabites? Where Rechab told his children, he says, none of my descendants after me are ever to drink any wine or anything with the grape. Not just, not alcohol, it's just, but uh, no alcohol, nothing with the grape. And they are not to dwell in permanent houses. They are to live in tents forever. And they were taken 
into Jerusalem for safety during the siege. And at the time, God said to Jeremiah, go to the Rechabites and tell them to come into this, this complex and sit down, give them some wine, and, and uh, you know, it, treat them nicely, okay? They sat down, and God knew this was going to happen. He's making a point about the Rechabites. He says, um, uh, give them the wine, sit down, and tell them to drink some wine. And all of the Rechabites said no. Our forefather, Rechab, which was several generations earlier, said that we are to dwell in tents and we are not to drink wine, okay? And we are going to stick by it. And so um, they said, but we are living in Jerusalem because of the siege. Maybe they were living in tents in Jerusalem, I don't know. But they weren't disobeying their father. They were preserving their father's memory by living in Jerusalem, but they would not break the father's. And here's what the Lord said. To Jeremiah, he said, tell the people that these people are obeying the word of a father, a human father, even generations later, and yet my people won't obey me. I am their creator. And so he made them an example, and he says, because of these people's faithfulness to their father, I promise to preserve a seed for them forever. So somewhere out in the desert of, of Syria or somewhere is a group of people, and I guarantee you that they live under the name of Rechab, whether anybody knows it or not. God promised it, and I guarantee you they are still out there dwelling in tents somewhere because he is faithful to his covenants. That's all there is to it. But that is the same thing. God is pleased when we are faithful to family traditions and family of values. And when we di divert from that, whether, whether or not it had anything to do with raising up a, a name for his son, it had to do with faithfulness in the family. We can know that with certainty based on other chapters in the Bible like the Rechabites. Anyway. Did God kill him because it had something to do with the lineage of Christ? No. But the lineage of Christ is coming in very soon. So this was not a surprise to God. Okay. It wasn't a surprise to God, but it is part of his sovereign plan. He knew this boy would do that, and that's why, before we go on, I'm going to answer your question in a way that will help you, because I brought this verse up many times. I quote it, I quote Acts 17 almost every time I talk about Jesus to somebody that is a, a little fuzzy on their theology. Acts 17 is when Paul is speaking at the Areopagus in Athens, okay? He never brings in the subject of Jesus or the Bible until the very end of his discourse. And it's not a long discourse, but it says that, and God proved this by raising a man from the dead or this man from the dead, okay? That's all he says about it, and people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. He uses a non-biblical defense to get people to simply think things through. So here we go. In Acts 17, it says here, I want somebody with the NIV. Who has the NIV? Okay, go ahead and read Acts 17, 26 through 28, and then we'll take a minute and we'll go over this. Because I, before you go on, I'm going to explain why I use this verse, especially Acts 17, 26 for this and Acts 17, 28 for something else. It's because people will argue, why? I, 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 I don't believe that God is all good, or I don't believe in Jesus, or he can't be the only way because um, Samuel Mutumbe lived in 1356 in Nairobi, Kenya, and he never got to hear about Jesus, and that's not fair. Okay, what about him? And this is going to explain that. Go ahead. God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all men life and breath, breath and, and all else. things. From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the times set for them, and the exact places where they should live. God did this so, so that, that men, men might seek, seek him. him. Perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For, for in him, him we live, live and, and move and, and have our being. being. I had to memorize the entire Acts 17 discussion for college, and so I've always remembered that, but I remembered it under the NASB. I couldn't use the NIV. NIV is much clearer in what he's saying there. He says he has determined the exact places and times where every person is to live so that men will seek him 
though they are not, he is not far from them, for in him we live and move and have our being. In other words, that guy, Samuel Matumbe or whatever, over in Nairobi, Kenya, would no more seek after Jesus Christ now than he would have then. Okay? That guy, Onan, would have been no better off living in New York City in 2011 than he was then. God chose his particular DNA to be transferred at that exact moment in time and in that exact place for his purposes. And he wouldn't have been any better off or any closer to God then than he is now. And if you want proof of that, if you want proof that this guy would no more over in Africa be saved here in America than he would have over there, just go down to the projects where I go every single Saturday or go to your neighbor's house that doesn't believe in Jesus, or go uh, to any church where all paths lead to God, and it proves it. Because those people have the chance right now with Bibles in every house in America, guaranteed, atheists have Bibles. They have churches on every single corner. They've got Christian radio. They've got Christian TV. And yet, they are not seeking after God. So you can't use the argument that this guy was given an unfair chance. Because they have been given the same chance and they're not taking it. Which proves that God is just in what he has done and where he has placed people. That proves it. There's no doubt about it. And what happened to Ernan, o, Onan and Ur is because God chose them knowing that they wouldn't have been any better anywhere else. So, no, it wasn't because he was disobedient about that, but God knew that. Okay? But yes, Judah is the one that selected Judah, didn't know it at the time, and that's why he... It, anyway, so do you understand the logic about that there, though? Okay. Up with Romans 1, whatever. Oh, sure. Romans 1 speaks about the depravity of man. We are, we are, it's uh, verses 18 through 20. Go ahead. Again, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, beginning being understood from what has been made, so that men, men are, are without, without excuse. excuse. That's right. And that's, that, that, that just confirms what Paul said in Acts 17. He's put us here, we know better. And we wouldn't have made any different choice no matter when or where we were. So that's why Onan is the second one to be killed. And we got 15 minutes. We, we'll, we're we not going to get done with 38, I but... Have a, I have a doctor's appointment. Okay, that's all right. It's a pleasure having you here. Sorry. That's all right. People come and go all the time. Monday, Saturday. I mean, this is the op most open and free class you'll ever be in. Uh, okay. And if you got a beef, just say it. We lo I love to get off on tangents because that's what makes it... As long as it's pertinent to what you're talking about, it's great. No, this is wonderful. Huh? I really appreciate it. All right. Lord bless you and have a, a wonderful doctor's visit. <laughs> okay, please, go ahead. Next verse. Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought, for he thought, I am afraid that he too may die like his brothers. So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. What he did is he said, she's supposed to be living in his house because she is the wife of his son. Okay, so he should have assimilated her into his house. But instead he says, go back to your father's house. And when my son is old enough, I'll give him to you. But he's not going to, he's not even intending on it. He's saying, she's already killed two guys. He thinks she's like a bad luck charm, right? And so I just want her out of my life. That's what he is doing there. You see that? Okay, go ahead. Now after a considerable time, Shua's daughter, the wife of Judah, died. And when the time of mourning was ended, Judah went up to his sheep shears at Timnah. He and his friend Hira, the Adolamite. Okay, Timnah, just so you know, is really a beautiful place. Mom and I have been there, and it's really beautiful. That's where Solomon's colonnades are. Very arid and dry, but it's a beautiful place. 